Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County lecture series. Today's event is French Immigrants to California with Dr. Anique Foucrier. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon. We are glad to see all of you here for today's program. This program is presented in partnership with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries on the library's Zoom meetings platform. We thank our wonderful library partners, Sarah Jones, Victor Willis, and Jessica Goodman for their assistance in supporting our programs. Today is National Library Workers Day. We at the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County want to recognize the excellent collaboration our society receives from all the staff of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Please join me in an enthusiastic Zoom acknowledgement of our library partners and feel free to uh, type a compliment to the library staff in the chat. For this month only, the Society's DNA Special Interest Group will hold its April monthly session one week from today on Tuesday, April 12, 2022 at 10 a.m. Next week, we will be discussing the Shared Santa Morgan Project. The DNA SIG will hold its May meeting at our regularly scheduled date on Tuesday, May 3 at 10 a.m. The DNA SIG sessions are held in person in the upstairs meeting room of Central Branch Library, where we have plenty of room to stay properly distanced. Look for reminder notices about the time and place of the DNA sessions. In a moment, I will introduce today's speaker. First, though, I want to let you know about our next program. In May, we will be joined by Joao Ventura, who will present a program on Portuguese and Azorian genealogical records and research. The June program is not yet finalized. I am delighted today to welcome Dr. Anique Foucrier, who will address us on the subject of French immigration to California in the 19th century. She will focus on French settlements in the state, French societies, and migration patterns. Dr. Foucrier is a professor emerita of North American history at the University of Paris Sorbonne and is the former director of the Center for Research in North American History. She has published many articles about the immigration of the French to California. Her studies include French immigrants in California in Chicago and elsewhere in the United States, as well as the history of California, the California Gold Rush, the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and the Pacific World. Dr. Foucrier's publications include, this is in French, Le Rêve Californien, Migrant Francais sur la Côte Pacifique, 18e au 20e siècle, Histoire et Société, and that is translated as The California Dream, French Migrants to the Pacific Coast in the 18th to 20th Centuries, History and Society. She is also the editor of the French and Pacific World 17th to 19th Century Exploration, Migrations, and Cultural Exchanges. We are extremely honored to have Dr. Anique Foucrier with us today. Please join me in giving Anique a warm Zoom welcome. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizer of this event, and it's uh, for me a pleasure to be here today to share with you some aspects of my research in archives. Uh, this is a cover of uh, the book that I published, Le Rêve California, in 1999 on the history of the French in California. It's currently out of print. I'm working on an update for, in, for a new edition. This history of the French in California covers the whole state of California and the whole period from the, from the 18th century to the end of the 20th century. I have used sources from French archives like vital records, passports, passengers list, consular archives, as well as sources found in California, censuses, naturalization records, great registers, directories, almanacs, county histories, newspapers, deeds, probates, archives of local societies, book of baptism and marriages from the French Church of San Francisco, 
I went also to Washington DC, Mexico City, and Spain. I also have made use of genealogies, family stories, memoirs, interviews, letters, correspondences, photo, illustration, and so on. And that is what I'm pleased to share with you today. First, just a general introduction. The prevalent image of the immigrant is that of a destitute, often illiterate person fleeing from a hopeless situation, ready to accept any job, however difficult, dangerous, and a paid jobs that native born would shun. The French migration has a low percentage of this category. At the beginning of the 20th century, the illiteracy rate was 5% in France. The greatest proportion of migrants were artisans, skilled workers, professionals, intellectuals, artists. They were younger sons of farmers because in the 19th century, in order to ensure the perpetuation of the family property, what was called the maison, the house, in some part of France, they had a choice only between becoming servants, priests, nuns, all activities leading to life as a bachelor or living. That didn't mean they severed all ties with their family, their village, and their country. Actually, they could benefit from money gathered by the family and from a specific and local background. It could be a manual training, a school education, or the experience of other members of the group. This allowed them to imagine a future away from their place of birth and to seize opportunities. These migrants were not merely expelled. They chose to leave in order to try to get a better life. A third category, also a minority, although important in French migrations, included modernizers and what we can call rebels in social, political, or cultural terms. Those migrants didn't get in their social environments the condition they needed to fulfill their ambitions, or they preferred to live a society they felt was oppressive. They might have been political activists, but they might also just have been independent personalities, thwarted in their projects by regulations and social hierarchy. They were vectors of cultural change. In this talk, First, I'll give general matters on migrations of the French to the US and to California. Secondly, I'll give a summary of the history of the French in California. Thirdly, I'll talk about departmental archives in France by showing you some of these documents that I have used. This graph, from figure of the Immigration and natural, Naturalization Service uh, is, um, show, uh, is both revealing and some inaccurate. Revealing because as you can see, high, there are high numbers at the times of the gold rush of the 1870s after the uh, French and Prussian War and at the beginning of the 20th century. But of course, there were not such huge differences between 1848 and 1854. Actually, the arrivals in 1849 were very numerous, but they were in San Francisco. And they probably were not as well recorded as those had been for New York and New Orleans, where the French would uh, go uh, um, previously. On a more national scale, um, I drew some from the census, numbers of censuses. I, I drew some graphs. You have uh, New York, California. Those who are in red are the, uh, the states where the number of people born in France increased. And in blue, where it decreased. So uh, those who, were, who increased were New York, California, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and those who decreased uh, were like Louisiana, very strong decline, uh, Indiana, uh, Ohio, Missouri, 
So uh, you see, there were different, uh, the, these French migrants were going to different places. And I put that on a map uh, the, uh, to, to have a, a, another view of it. And in red, you have the state where the number of, of, of people born in France between 1850 and 1930 increased. And in blue, where it decreased. And as you can uh, well see, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the French immigration declined in the historical states of the Mississippi Valley and the French Empire, like Louisiana, Ohio, Indiana, Mississippi, while the numbers increased in the more economically dynamic states of California, New York, and the Northeast. And you can find the same phenomenon at another scale when you compare counties in a state. During, uh, you can uh, uh, then, uh, this is uh, uh, the numbers uh, in California, people born in France in California, according to the censuses again, and the percent in California population. You can see that uh, there is a, uh, the, during the 19th century, the number of French born residents of California increased regularly while their percentage in the California population declined because they, it didn't increase as fast as uh, the population, the California population. And you can just uh, maybe uh, note that there is uh, uh, an increase between 1910 and 1920, despite the fact that many young men left to go back to uh, Europe for the war and that European immigrants were less able to cross the Atlantic Ocean at that time for the situation of the war between 1914, 1918. And uh, in fact, uh, one reason for this increase is that in 1920, the inhabitants from Alsace and Lorraine were again counted as French in the census, which had not been the case from 1880 to 1910, when uh, they uh, were counted in the German Empire. If we now we compare the evolution of the numbers of inhabitants of California born in France with some other European nationalities, uh, we can see that the specificity of French migration in red is that numbers are relatively low, but increase regularly. While in green, the high Irish migration is, that, is at its stop in the 1890s. The number of people born in Germany, uh, this one, increased with two lows at the time of the world wars and were at an old height in 1980. As for the last graph, the Italians arrived uh, later on and they reached their highest numbers from 1930 to 1960. And we can see also that only for the French, the numbers increased after 1990, that goes only to 2000, which is a sign of a recent immigration of young people. Now, the history of uh, French immigration in California. Uh, the first Frenchman in California arrived in the 18th century. The first person born in France and documented as being in California was Pierre Pedro Prat, who arrived in 1769 and was a surgeon in the Portola expedition. Some 13 years later, the archives of Mission Buenaventura revealed the presence of a sailor from Lorient in Brittany, Pierre Roy, who acted as godfather for an Indian. Nothing more is known of him, whether he stayed or left from some other place. A few years later, in 1786, a vessel of the scientific expedition commanded by Jean-Francois Gallo de la Pérouse set anchor at, uh, in Monterey Bay. This visit is recalled by a plaque in the patio of Mission San Carlos Borromeo, 
presented by the government of the French Republic in 1947. The scientists of the expedition seized the opportunity to study the inhabitants and the natural environment. La Perouse had the coast map, and after a visit to the Carmel mission, then in its beginnings, the French officers gave to the Indians and the missionaries fruit tree seeds, potatoes, and a hand mill to ease the work of the women. That was a transfer of technology, although it didn't succeed then, for social and cultural reasons. And this plaque is written in French and in English. In the 1830s and 1840s, the French were about 85, plus a, friend, a few French-speaking French French Canadians, Swiss, and Belgians. Belgians. Before 1848, California was hardly known in France and couldn't be a magnet. The prevalent forces in this migration were those of expulsion, what is called the push by opposition to the pool that are the forces of attraction. And for example, demographic pressure, the competition of the industrial revolution for artisans. Those who reached California arrived mainly through Spain, Mexico, or the Pacific Ocean. California was not much developed, but it offered enough opportunities for French people to come for trading or whaling first to provide services later. Eventually, they were numerous enough in a new nation so that the French government sent warships and founded in 1842 a consulate in Monterey. A few dozen Frenchmen, one French woman, lived in California, mainly in Monterey, Los Angeles, and San Francisco before 1846. The first French migrants who come to California could be found in a large variety of economic activities. They benefited from the opportunities of a developing economy that needed men with trades. Carpenters, viticulturists, teachers were in demand and were often successful. But even runaway sailors from whalers, for example, were able to improve their lot through land property and marriage. This is uh, a property map when uh, San Francisco was uh, Yaba Buena, and you can see the property of a Frenchman, Victor Prudon, who at the time was a secretary to uh, Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. To take another example, in the 1830s, some French residents were pioneers in wine growing in Southern California. Jean-Louis Vigne especially deserved the very coveted qualification of father of California quality viticulture. He arrived in 1831. He was not the first to grow grapes over here. The missionaries had brought vines from Mexico for mass purposes. But the wine thus produced was too sweet. John Levinus ordered cuttings to be shipped from his native region of Bordelais, uh, near Bordeaux, to Boston, and then around Cape Horn to San Pedro and to Los Angeles to prevent uh, those uh, cuttings uh, to, um, uh, to losing their moisture, they had been picked into potatoes. In California, they were grafted on local roots. Vigne, who was a cooper by trade, also had a cellar with oak barrels to age the wine. There is still a street named Vines, uh, Vignes, near uh, Union Station, where his vineyard was, as well as a Boucher Street from another French viticulturist. Louis Boucher arrived around, around 1827. He was from uh, Champagne. He applied for a passport in Veracruz in 1825. In 1855, Vignes sold his property to his nephews, Pierre and Jean-Louis Saint-Sever. Pierre was a carpenter. He had arrived in California in 1839. In 1856, he made a trip to France in order to learn how to produce champagne. And that is what he did after that with his brother. Uh, Pierre Saint-Sever is also known in Santa Cruz history. He owned a sawmill on the San Lorenzo River as a place named El Rincon. He operated this sawmill with Charles Roussillon. There, they hired French runaway sailors like Alexandre Bénard, 
Alejandro Andan, who arrived in 1843, or Joseph Frey, who arrived in 1846. Jean-Richard Fourcade, uh, Ricardo, also a former sailor, married the daughter of Martinas Castros, and Joseph Aveyron married another one. And as you can see, there were four different regions like Gironde, for saint Sevin Roussillon, Calva, or, or and also the Foucault brothers. Uh, that is the southwest, the near port. Uh, um, Bena was uh, from Calvados, which is in Normandy, near also near the sea. Uh, François Poilot was uh, from Bayonne, uh, the Basque country, uh, near also a port. And uh, uh, Joseph Aveyron, well, I'm, I don't really know. Uh, they were counted uh, uh, 13 in the 1852 census, but somewhere in the mines at that time. In 1860, according to the census, these uh, uh, person, this pr um, persons born in France were around 60, mainly farmers. And I, uh, I wrote an article uh, in the Santa Cruz County History Journal in uh, 2014. Then came the gold rush and the situation in California changed dramatically between 1846 and 1848. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo transformed the Mexican province into an American territory and the discovery of gold mines launched a mass migration immigration. The rapid growth of the population allowed the region to, became, uh, uh, to become a state and a much needed constitution was drafted by 48 delegates, among whom were Pierre Saint-Sévin, previously mentioned, and Rosé Maria Covarrubias, who was uh, French and who had arrived in 1834 with the Irak and Padres Company and had settled in Santa Barbara. The discovery of gold attracted about 40,000 Frenchmen and women. They scattered everywhere, but with gathering in the mining towns of the foothills in San Francisco and Los Angeles. There, French quarters developed, forcing the French government to reopen the consulate, suppressed in 1848 to save money, but now local localized in San Francisco in 1850, and also the government had to create another uh, vice consulate in Los Angeles in 1859. So you can see here, those are um, advertisements in uh, uh, French newspapers for companies that, uh, uh, that organize to send people to California. So you have those names like La Toison d'Or, uh, you, you can see all oh, this gold. And so they, they would uh, use that kind of uh, uh, words to attract the attention and uh, uh, the money of the, of the people. So where, where did these people came? I uh, drew two maps um, uh, and they were actually from all over France. These two maps are uh, statistical treatment of lists of passenger from 30 ships who left France from 1849 to 1851. It's a sample of this population. Uh, they were the first wave of gold seekers. Although most were born in small villages, an, import, in, an important percentage had lived in Paris which can be seen by the difference between the departments of birth on the left and the departments of residence before leaving France. Economic and political turmoil were certainly causes of their departures, but these migrants were not among the poorest because they had to pay for their trip. With the passengers list I found, I created a database I've told uh, you about and uh, uh, after searching uh, uh, sources in different departments in France, I published articles on how they were able to gather the 1,000 francs they needed to pay for their travel, because that uh, was at that time an important uh, uh, sum of money. Uh, a, a common laborer would uh, earn only three francs uh, a day when he had work. 
So artisan shopkeepers, landowners were the majority of these pioneers. Like many other migrants who came for, from the East Coast of, of America, Europe, Mexico, or even China, they hoped they would earn enough money to go back home soon and solve their economic difficulties. Eventually, their return rate was high. So in California, they looked for gold, but also for land. Although the uh, gold miners, the French left San Francisco to go to the mines as soon as possible. They traveled in small groups, trying their luck from one place to another. Being in a foreign land, a minority among the population, they tended to gather with other people who would speak the same language and, say, and share similar values like religion, cultural habits, Sunday practices, for example. Some travelers' accounts attributed them specific characteristics, merry disposition, taste for good food, as well as more common features, waiting for news, longing for home. And after a week of hard work, Sunday was, like in France, a time for reunion, for renewing the bonds of sociability, for being together, so has to overcome nostalgic disposition. They gathered in large groups, eating beef, drinking wine, just like they would have done in France, having a good time, discussing, toasting, singing. And the following Monday, everybody would resume mining, maybe a little later than a regular day, with renewed hopes to strike it rich. Some did find gold, like Claude Chardin uh, at Auburn, and this statue is in honor of the fact that he discovered gold at that place. Some others settled on the land, like Madame Josephine Felix in Calaveras County. It's interesting because we don't have that many women. So this example is interesting. And there were many more in other counties, including, of course, Santa Cruz County. In San Francisco, the French gathered first around Commercial Street. Some years later, many lived around Dupont Street, now Grant. They sent money to bring their family and they created new ones. In 1856, they had founded a French Roman Catholic church where those who were Catholic were married, where their children were baptized and where funerals were celebrated. The documents still exist thanks to the French priest who saved the books in 1906 and they are written in Latin. So uh, the church still has the books of baptisms and marriages, uh, not of fu funerals. And I uh, published uh, an article using those uh, documents. Docu uh, I published several, but at least one in English. Um, those who decided to stay in California founded organization for solidarities like the French Benevolent Mutual Society and the uh, French Hospital in San Francisco since 1851. This is a, a, a view in 1894 uh, when it had been um, rebuilt because they started very, with a very small uh, building. Uh, they did so uh, creating this kind of uh, association and uh, uh, hospital everywhere. They were numerous enough, like in the gold rush villages. This uh, example in Mokalumne Hill, Calaveras County, where there were many uh, French people. Uh, this hospital uh, was founded in 1851. Of course, there are only now the, uh, a few stones but it used to be uh, a very uh, efficient place. And, uh, and uh, on the right, the plaque at the French hospital in uh, Los Angeles uh, um, uh, showed that it uh, was founded in 1869 and the giving the name of the French doctors and uh, who worked there because uh, there were, uh, were mainly French doctors and French nurses. In San Francisco, they had a French consulate, as I said, a firefighter company, the Lafayette Hook and Ladder Company, several newspapers, uh, L'Eco du Pacifique is the most famous 
It lasted until uh, 1865 when it was destroyed at the time of the Civil War. And uh, they had also libraries, a theater, a theater schools, and uh, all kind of uh, entertainment places. They were part of the growth of the city and of it, its political life. And for example, in 1856, 300 Frenchmen were members of the Committee of Vigilance. There were also newspapers in Los Angeles. They provided information, local information, and from the old country. It is a fantastic source to know the lives and the networks of these migrants. But as you can see, they are very fragile and they are in great danger to disappear. Those are uh, the Courrier de Los Angeles and Le Francais. And they are uh, all in French. Uh, these French uh, people also operated many stores, including dry, big dry goods stores like the city of Paris, you will recognize here, the stained glass uh, that is uh, with the, the stair, uh, staircase, it's all that stays from the old um, uh, uh, store that was destroyed uh, in 1906, but rebuilt after that. And, uh, uh, the stained glass is uh, a testimony to uh, the name uh, city of Paris, that was the name of the first ship who brought uh, um, uh, goods for this uh, family, and, uh, and it's uh, the, uh, the motto of uh, Paris. Uh, you have also the White House in San Francisco, now it's a Banana Republic, but uh, the building is still there. And, and of course, uh, there they, they were French laundries. The French laundries uh, was an expression that became a common name, were actually very numerous at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, a book, uh, the, the Guide of the French in uh, California in 1916, published by George Lanson, listed 135 laundries and 15 dyers in San Francisco. Uh, most of them were some small family businesses with a few employees and specialized in end finishing. French laundry came to mean high quality, and it was a commercial argument. Uh, very often, those uh, who um, uh, operated those laundries were from Bayern or from the, uh, the Alps. So this is an example of how these French migrants created economic niche. Many arrived by way of chain migration to get a job with the help of parents, friends, and or previous neighbors. For those who came from the same region, sometimes speaking the same dialect, clubs, region, regional associations were created to strengthen networks. These clubs and associations organized picnics and other festivities. Many marriages at their origins in one of these events. The social fabric was rewoven through marriages and birth. Many of these French uh, people rest in local cemeteries, like uh, these two examples, among many other ones, of uh, uh, tombstones. One is uh, from Mission Dolores in San Francisco, and uh, it's written in French, and Pierre Griot, uh, is mentioned as a baker from Bordeaux who died at age 52. And uh, uh, the mention of uh, be, he, uh, him being a, a baker shows he, his pride in his profession. Uh, so that's uh, interesting to see that. The other one is uh, also very interesting. It's uh, Francois Lebeau in Mokalame Hill, Calaveras County. And it's written, Francois Lebeau uh, was uh, born in saint herme and uh, the department, is, uh, département de, it's not very clear, France, France. And he, he died at Chili Gulch on June 4, 1872, uh, with the mention that he was then 49 years and nine months. And uh, with an easy calculation, uh, that leads to a birth er about October 1822. There is a Saint Herme in Aisne, A-I-S-N-E, which is a department uh, uh, north, uh, in the north of France. 
<coughs> and their archives are online. So on the site of the Department of Archives, it's possible to search in the decimal uh, tables. There, a uh, F logo appears with a mention of September 19, 1822. It's then easy to look at the books of birth and find a uh, François Honoré, uh, like you can see here, Lebeau was born on September 19, 1822. So uh, that is uh, the, uh, the birth uh, record of um, François Lebeau. And you can uh, see the signature of the father. Uh, it's very rare, uh, it's well, uh, it's pretty rare that the, the, uh, at that time, the, the, um, the father would uh, sign, he did. And, but as you can see, there is no X at the end of his name as, his, as the father signs it, while on the uh, tombstone, there is, um, uh, there is an X. So uh, we have uh, to remember that uh, the, the, the names uh, might uh, change in their spelling. We can also find French documents in province in California. There might be wills, letters, copies of vital records, like uh, in this uh, uh, occasion, because they had to prove the family relations. Probates were actually often a way to despoil the heirs, especially when they lived in another country. In this case, uh, Dos, uh, Louis Dossé, D O S. Um, SST, which is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the name, um, and it is, no, it, it is uh, uh, mentioned as Louis Dassa, uh, who died uh, March 19, 80, uh, 1891. The inventory gave uh, $1,329.50, almost uh, 1400 The heirs received eventually for uh, 163.06 uh, dollars, uh, which uh, of course is uh, it's short from uh, the, the, the sum. The administrator declared his expenses being almost 700, 691.09. Uh, so uh, also I put uh, um, uh, uh, Jean Bank, uh, the, uh, in, the amount of uh, the value of the of the estate uh, was uh, twenty uh, three thousand, uh, a little bit more. It would be uh, today seven hundred eighty three thousand. So uh, some made a good uh, deal of money. <clears throat> um, the gold rush did not last long, and returns were numerous. But those who stayed started chain migration by writing to families, friends, and former neighbors. The improvements in transportation with uh, the completion of the transcontinental in 1869, steam powered ships, and the lower prices made it easier for European migrants to go to the West Coast. Immigrants were younger, many came to join parents. The main regions concerned with immigration to California uh, were the Pyrenees, as you can see, the Alps and Aveyron in the center of France. After 1870, migrants from Alsace and Lorraine grew also more numerous. And uh, among the documents that uh, I'll show you, uh, you have a document from uh, Pyrenees Atlantique, Béarn and Basque Country, Haute Pyrenees uh, and Eastern Pyrenees. Aveyron, of course, uh, uh, Haute-Alpes and uh, Alsace, Moselle, uh, and also Seine-Maritime, where Ave is, Dordogne in the southwest, Gers, and of course, Gironde. In 1914, the war started in Europe. Young men, French citizens, were called to arm. Many of, uh, went back to France and many died on the battlefields. After the end of the war, the memory was preserved in monuments, plaques, lists of deaths, like this one in the French church in San Francisco. 
And uh, uh, you will have a list of uh, the young men from San Francisco who died during the war. And what is interesting it, it, with this name is that it's possible to find their records in French archives. Like I uh, chose uh, Marcelin uh, Magendi, Marcel uh, Magendi, because his father was uh, very well known in the, in the, the San Francisco uh, uh, French colonies. And uh, were going to the archives of the Ministry for Defense, uh, they, uh, you, you can find his record uh, where and when he was born, which was uh, uh, in in uh, Basse Pyrénées, Pyrénées Atlantique, where and when he was killed, which was uh, Moranvilliers in Marne, the eastern part of France, and the date, and he was killed in battle and where uh, he lived before the war. And as you can see at the bottom, his last known, uh, the last place where he lived was in San Francisco uh, in America. And so you have uh, a website with, uh, which is in, in also in English, where it's possible to question, to, to, uh, to find some uh, men who fought during the First War, and uh, especially those who, uh, uh, who died, but not only. And uh, I, uh, I gave you the, uh, uh, the, the, the precise possibility. So my third part now is uh, French departmental archives. Uh, and I limit myself to Archive Departemental because uh, uh, it's, well, it's huge, but uh, the municipal and as well as national archives are, are also useful documents. This is a view uh, of the entrance of the building of departmental archives in Auch, Gers, in the southwest. This one is the entrance in Perpignan, Eastern Pyrenees. And this one is the entrance is Metz, is Moselle. So you can see the buildings are different, but the organization is always the same, with the same call numbers. And, and now there are also the archives online. And I took one example, but it's the same. Websites are just like new entrances to the archives. Every department has its own. It might be different in appearance, but, and, and the documents may, might be slightly different, but the structure is the same. You have, and you can access very easily, registre paroissiaux et d'état civil, vital records, list nominative de recensement de la population, the list of names in censuses, um, the uh, matricule militaire, military records, the cadastre napoléonien, uh, donc the cadastre, register of properties, the minute notarial, the notary archives. In large cities, there would be many notaries, but in small towns, it's easy to find which one with the notary of the family. So let's start with the vital records. Uh, this is a declaration of birth, and it's uh, Enfleur Calvados, and it's Alexandre. Adrien Benard, 1823, uh, uh, better known as Alejandro Andean in uh, uh, Santa Cruz. But that is, uh, uh, it's, it's easy online to find his um, uh, birth record, like many other ones. This is an uh, uh, interesting uh, kind of uh, uh, specificity. Uh, this is from Gers, and you have here three classes of declaration of birth. You have the children who were, in a way, legitimate, uh, those who were born uh, out of marriage, uh, but had been recognized by the parents, and those who had been just abandoned. And uh, uh, I found one example uh, in uh, Saint Malo, Vilaine, uh, in uh, Brittany. The declaration of birth of a foundling, Joseph Marie Cesar de Merville, who is known uh, uh, as Pedro Artigliano in Monterey. And uh, the, uh, uh, the mayor uh, ex uh, explains 
uh, their, well, uh, what happened exactly and how and why he gave the name Joseph Marie César de Merville to a child who had absolutely no relative known. Then, um, also in Brittany, at saint Servant, not very far from Saint-Malo, the uh, marriage record of Marie Baudou, Baudou and René Hervago. The marriage was usually celebrated where the bride's parents lived, but it was announced in both places, so it's possible to find it. A marriage record is a document loaded with information for a genealogist. It can be completed with a marriage contract that is in notary archives. And that is an example. An example is uh, for the marriage contract of Ernest Pagnon de Fontaubert. He was in California from 1852 when he arrived with his sister Ernestine to 1862 when he was murdered in Calaveras County. And uh, he had uh, given a proxy, and I'll talk about that later, to his wife, Therese. So this is a table of uh, a marriage contracts. So uh, it's possible to find them alphabetically. Uh, uh, that, was, that is in Dordogne, the Southwest. And, uh, and then uh, you have also the list. This is a list of the, uh, um, the acts uh, by the notary. And in this list, you find here marriage between François Ernest Pagnon de Fontaubert, de Monsigou, and Thérèse Dana. And you have here the date and also the number. And uh, so that's a uh, list. And, and besides that, you have all kind of uh, uh, deeds and uh, uh, leases and all kind of other documents. Then you can go to the notary um, um, uh, archives, and you can find also some lists that can help you to find uh, the document. And this is a document. You find the same number as we've seen uh, on uh, the uh, uh, regist uh, uh, registry. And this is the first and last pages of uh, the marriage contract. Uh, it's uh, four pages. And what is interesting that you have the names at the beginning, and then you have all the signature. And then you can see that even the women signed and Therese uh, was able to sign quite well. Um, then uh, also uh, we uh, can find in the archives death and inheritance records, declaration of death. This one is um, Ernestine, uh, Ernest's um, sister, and she's mentioned as Catherine uh, because very often you would have uh, their, their birth name, but then in family, you would use uh, different names. So uh, Ernestine uh, acted as um, bus a business partner with his brother, with her brother, when uh, she was in uh, California. And, and when he died, uh, murdered, she managed to be named administratrix. And she was able to salvage a part of the value of their business, careful not to carry gold or money with her on a trip back to France. She had the money sent to a notary in Paris through a bank draft. And then the money was to be sent to her where she lived in Dordogne. But very suspiciously, she died a short time after the money arrived at the family's notaries. Her sisters and her brother, uh, another brother, were, uh, were her heirs, and they needed the money. So here you can see the inventory of what uh, was her property, and also uh, the heirs. And that you can find through uh, document list, uh, uh, document recorded. And then we have many documents uh, about uh, emigration. We have, for example, power of attorney, proxy. This one is the example of uh, by Etienne 
Pascal Conlon, uh, and he was um, um, was from uh, old uh, uh, Narbonne. See, so that's the south. Uh, um, it's not very far from uh, um, Eastern Pyrenees. Uh, and uh, that was in August 1849. So he gave the proxy to his father. Uh, but some of the ones who are uh, other travelers, immigrants, who gave to their wife or to a lawyer. By the same occasion, very often they would write their will because despite their hopes and their optimism, the future was very uncertain. So you can find that in the notary records. Another very interesting doc type of document is passport. In order to leave the country, one needed a passport, the legal authorization to cross the borders. It will also entitle the traveler to the protection of the council. The major place to find this type of documents is currently Bordeaux, a major port of departure at this time. At half, the passports have been destroyed. But they, there are some other passports in uh, other uh, departments, like in J, uh, but uh, often they are not very numerous. Uh, they are also in Rochefort. You can see there are five for year 1833, and only one um, to San Francisco. Other ones are Buenos Aires, Barcelona, um, Rio de Janeiro. You have a different uh, destination, of course. Um, they quite often they have been destroyed during the war, for example, but also sometimes for lack of space. The documents produced to obtain a passport are also important. I took the uh, example of Jean Barba in Charente. First, he applied to the mayor, and then there were many mentions like color, size, hair, uh, age, and uh, shape of the face. And those mentions will be copied on the passport. That was uh, July 24, 1834. Then the application was forwarded to the prefect in July 26, 1834 uh, by the um, sub-prefect. Then the prefect uh, asked for more information like the destination and the motive of the departure of uh, this young man. So you see, you can find interesting information in those documents. Uh, unfortunately, they are not that many. Another type of document is uh, the, uh, the passenger's list. I mentioned a little bit. And those are the best ones are in Havre, because in Bordeaux, they have been destroyed by fire. Uh, but um, they are the list of disarmaments of ships, and in, uh, they are uh, six by six, uh, inscription maritime, Mary, uh, the registers. And uh, they give the names of the crew, some of also list of passengers, and to find a, pass a traveler, it's, uh, it's necessary to know on which ship he had traveled. But it's sometimes written on the back of the passport. So you can see here, the um the doc, uh, the list uh you know the uh the, the list of the of the ships and with the uh year when they were disarmed and uh, uh the call number uh so uh that is how it looks on the right you have the first page for one of these ships that uh, left France at the time of the gold rush to go to San Francisco, California. Uh, her name was La Ceres. This is an enlargement of the first page. And there is a mention of certificates of uh, medicine and of course the destination and when it was built where there's a lot of information. On the last page, there is an itinerary uh, uh, with uh, a stop in Cayo and then arrival in San Francisco with the dates and signed by the uh, local councils. Then you also have the list of crew with their vital information. And that when you are looking for a sailor, it's very, very interesting. You find also in this case, lists of passengers 
And I took uh, uh, three, uh, three uh, the beginning, the three first, three passengers uh, among 140 uh, some. Auguste Parizeau, who was 35, was a trader. Christophe uh, Ernest Massé, who was 38, landowner. Barthélemy Descartes, who was 40 years, merchant clerk. And I uh, put all that in a database. And I have some uh, uh, good numbers, several, uh, 1,400, uh, 1, some uh, uh, more or less. And, uh, and with a, a very interesting information like the name, uh, first name, uh, 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 for women, you have uh, the both names, uh, the age and where they were born, which department, where they lived before leaving France, department, a profession. So it's possible with that to have a statistical study, which uh, I did, and that's how I drew uh, these uh, these two maps. Uh, and uh, also from uh, that database, I uh, studied the origins and how they gathered the money for the trip. Uh, and uh, I did that in several articles, uh, mostly in French, uh, except uh, one in English that I mentioned uh, uh, somewhere else. So I looked in the notary archives to find the proxies and the way they were able to gather the amount of money necessary to pay the cost of the travel. When they borrowed money, which is uh, often, it, uh, it was usually for two years, which means they thought they would be back soon. So this is a, a very interesting source that's not very often used, but give information. So more uh, well-known source, of course, is letters. And uh, it's uh, so interesting a uh, source to know uh, about the life of a migrant. These two examples were written one on board the ship, Magellan, and the other one was um, dated uh, June 1853 from a place called, he called I-N-C-T-O-N-N-E. And, uh, and of course, in English, you would uh, read that in tone, but in French, it, uh, uh, it, it writes differently. It writes en tone, which of course is a different place. Um, the, you, uh, another uh, type of interesting documents you can find in the department archives are the military sources with uh, uh, the enrollment records. And uh, this, is, this document is more a uh, uh, different can. It's a certificate of good behavior of uh, Pierre Hippolyte Dalide, who settled in San Luis Obispo. Uh. So um, in the course of this research, I met with wonderful persons, primarily Marion Pacria, Judy Debera, Woman Greet, and Denis Salé, Carol uh, Darmerval, uh, and uh, many others. And I want to thank them for the good time spent doing research together. Thank you for your attention. Okay, and you have several questions. Good. <laughs> All right, let's start at the top. Someone said we met several years ago when you did a similar program with Marion Pocria, uh, Pierre Artelon. I don't speak yes. any French. Pierre I'm so Arti sorry. Artelon, my, yes. my wife's third great-grandfather came to Monterey in 1835 and you connected him to César de Merville from mm -hmm. St. Malo, France. So that's appreciation there for you. Uh, well, my pleasure. And the next question is, are there sources to access records related to French Benevolent Society of member in California? Yes, I, I use their records they have very interesting records. I did, uh, actually I drew um, a map of uh, where the French uh, were in San Francisco uh, around 1858. Uh, these records, um, it's, uh, they are still in uh, the, the position of, the, uh, of uh, this society. 
So that's uh, to them that, uh, that any uh, question inquiry should be uh, addressed. I have uh, uh, the list that I copied myself, but it's uh, far from uh, the total. Okay. Your next question says, Francois Lebeau's tombstone has symbol of Odd Fellows Fraternal Order. Have you found many French Californians who were member of, members of IOOF? Yes, there were many. I've not really uh, um, uh, looked for, for that, but they were, they were members of, there were some who were uh, Masons, uh, uh, and there, there were at several of uh, French and French American uh, Mason societies. Uh, there were uh, some who were uh, actually, yes, uh, uh, were art fellows. And uh, uh, because that was important, that was solidarity. And so they, they needed, uh, once they had decided or they had accepted to stay in California, uh, they, well, they needed some, uh, uh, some social uh, insertion and, uh, and those societies provided that. Great, thank you. Your next question says, Father John Clifford of University of Santa Clara survived the concentration camp in Shanghai, China because he stayed behind, wouldn't leave Aurora Mon Mondale University. In the presence of my enemies, is Clifford a French last name? Uh, how do you spell it? Uh, 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 C L I F F O R D. I don't think so. It doesn't sound French. I'm sorry. All right. Next question. Are there financial records for unclaimed property in France? I found a divorce record in Santa Clara County of my third great grandfather, Jean Pierre. Du Tasse and his second wife. She claimed that Jean Pierre had a bank account in Mont Saint Michel. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, would you please uh, say again uh, the beginning of the question? Yes. The question is Are there financial records for unclaimed property in France? I believe this attendee believes there, there may be some unclaimed property. Well, uh, that's, uh, that might be a long time ago. So since it probably has been, uh, 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 you know, if it was not claimed in uh, California uh, by people in California, then there would be some other hairs in France. So I don't think that any property would, uh, since it was so important, uh, vital, uh, would uh, stay unclaimed uh, very long. Okay, thank you. Your next question. Have you been able to have your book translated into English yet? Well, uh, it's uh, actually, it's in the process of uh, being translated. That's uh, my uh, next important uh, project. Uh, I, um, and I really, uh, I think it's, it's important because it's part of the history of California. It's very, uh, uh, there are lots of in valuable information for, for people and, uh, and there is nothing, uh, nothing uh, uh, like that, uh, that exists. So I think that for, uh, for teachers, for uh, descendants of uh, French people, it could be interesting uh, to, to give them uh, uh, a better knowledge of uh, this, uh, this history that is just fascinating. Thank you. Happy to hear it. All right. Next question. Have you explored French immigrants who first moved to Central America in the 1820s and then came to California during the gold rush? Oh, well, even uh, uh, during the gold rush and before. Yes, I have a list of these. Uh, I actually, I work with uh, some uh, uh, Mexican researchers um, who are interested in uh, French immigrants to Mexico. And I published several um, articles uh, with them because you have uh, 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 like, uh, I think uh, I mentioned Jose Maria Covarrubias, he arrived through um, uh, through Mexico. 
And the same thing for, for uh, Henry Combustor in, uh, in uh, Monterey. He also arrived in Veracruz and he had brothers in Veracruz. And so it's, uh, what is interesting is to see also the, the family relations between how these uh, uh, immigrants actually, they're not alone, they're not moving uh, in, uh, in a void. They actually are following uh, paths and, uh, and the networks, family networks uh, or professional networks or, so um, yes, uh, uh, I, when I was a teacher um, uh, um, of North American history, that meant I would teach history of United States, Canada, and Mexico, because that's North America. And there are so many, many uh, relations between uh, these, uh, the people, especially in migration history, uh, because between the people in the different um, uh, nations, borders are just crossed. Thank you for that answer. Okay, the next question, can we access your database or gold rush passengers? Well, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can send me uh, a question uh, because it's not, not yet uh, on, online. So um, I think the best way is just if you're looking for some, uh, uh, some specific person, uh, you just can uh, through uh, the, San, the Santa Clara um, Genealogical uh, um, Society. You, you, can, you can just uh, uh, ask for a name. Great. Next question. You kind of skipped over the story of, I don't know how to say this. It's L apostrophe I-N-G-O-T. Could you explain? Oh, the lango, the lango. Actually, uh, it's uh, L-I-N-G-O-T-S. E, well, yes and no, uh, it's true. Uh, the uh, that that was uh, a company, one of these companies, uh, Le Lango d'Or, and uh, they organized a lottery uh, so that they uh, would get money uh, to uh, send to California five thousand French people, and I have the list of passengers uh, of all. The, the ships, I think 17 uh, more or less, uh, with all the names and all the information. Uh, the reason why I didn't uh, mention it is that, <laughs> well, there's so many things to mention. I, I could have just uh, uh, put a slide uh, on then. Uh, this is uh, something that is uh, pretty well known actually. And um, uh, they, they were, they were different from, uh, I, I, I talked about the pioneers who paid for their trip. Uh, the lingo, uh, the lango, they were, they didn't pay for the trip. So uh, some were poorer than the previous one who came, but also there were many who were actually from the family of uh, the previously arrived. And uh, so you had many families arriving at that time in 1852, 1853, and 1854. That was a specificity. And there has been a lot of uh, you know, phantasmas uh, uh, about this uh, group of people. Uh, they, it's, uh, it's a long story. Well, I appreciate you elaborating on that. Next question says, have the archives, I'm not going to say this correctly, Alsace, Alsace, A-L-S-A-C-E, um, been moved since the joining of the three provinces? Okay, so uh, uh, the, no, uh, the, um, what happened is that in 1871, uh, uh, France lost the war. So uh, Germany, to uh, the German Empire took uh, these uh, uh, territories that were full of coal and uh, and and um, and uh, iron ore, so uh, very rich uh, territories. Those were Alsace, uh, Bas-Rhin, and Haut-Rhin, uh, 
which is uh, uh, along the Rhine and a part of Lorraine. Usually you say Alsace-Lorraine, but it actually was Moselle. And I showed you uh, the, uh, uh, the entrance of uh, the archives. So uh, what the change that happened is that uh, uh, Moselle became a, a separate um, uh, department. And uh, the, uh, the rest of uh, was called Meurthe and Moselle. Uh, but uh, uh, Alsace, it didn't change lot, uh, a lot, except, of course, that uh, the, uh, the, it was written in uh, more in German and uh, there were uh, some changes uh, because of the uh, political situation. But basically it's possible to do research in um, Alsace. Uh, of course, uh, the, sp the, the spelling and, and the calligraphy it might be different and uh, uh, it's not always very easy to, um, uh, to read, but uh, no more than uh, uh, in any other place. So no, and there is a very, there, there were many um, uh, French people were born in Alsace uh, and uh, Moselle when they were French uh, or even after who uh, uh, came to California and uh, uh, lived uh, among the French community. Okay, your next question says very interesting. Thank you so much for your presentation. I am Thank from you. Brittany, living oh. in the Silicon Valley. Lots of street names come from French families. Ever heard of a Stendhal, S-T-E-N-D-H-A-L? And uh, Oh, Stendhal. S-T-E-N-D-H-A-L, he was a writer. Uh, uh, Stendhal, it, it was actually Henri Bell, and his uh, name uh, as a writer uh, was uh, Stendhal. Uh, uh, if, uh, I, I suppose that's uh, the reason of the name, uh, it's, um, but uh, that's the only one that I know. Uh, I never heard of, uh, of some family name, French family name, but it could be, I mean, I don't know everything. And then another person commented on that same question, and it said, I lived by Stendhal Lane in Cupertino. My ancestors came to San Jose from St. Servain, sur mer uh, and then maybe I-L-L-E-E-T-V-I-L-L-N. Oui, ille vilaine ille vilaine that's, uh, ille vilaine, that's uh, right. It is, it's, um, it is uh, the department. And I, c'est Saint-Servant, Saint-Servant, I uh, showed uh, uh, um, a document from Saint-Servant, uh, the marriage of um, uh, Marie Baudu and René Hervago. Okay, another... And uh, yes, that's, uh, and the archives are, are uh, it's possible to, uh, you, to uh, look uh, through the departmental archives, but that would be in Rennes and the municipal archives. Great, your next question says, where can I go look for French concessions territories in Shanghai, China, where Aurora Mondale was? Maybe some history about that university founded by French Jesuit priests? Well, I'm not very familiar with that. If, uh, um, if it's about uh, Jesuit priest, uh, the best would be to go to the congregation, to the archives of the congregation, wherever they were from. I, uh, I, uh, I assume there should be things in the uh, Vatican archives. There are great uh, archives in the Vatican, in Rome. But uh, I do, uh, uh, French concession, there might be that also, uh, if they had been French concessions, that might be in either the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry of Colonies. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, there is one in uh, near Paris, Perfit. And uh, no, it's very interesting too for uh, uh, 
the archives that come from the consulate and uh, the archives of uh, the colonies uh, are in Aix en Provence, which is in southeast of, uh, of France. Okay, the next question is again a property question. Where can I go look to find out where the French people started to build in Shanghai, China, like own properties before the war with the Japanese prior to 1937 or so? So it, it is in Shanghai. Shanghai, there still, uh, uh, well, I went a few years ago and there was uh, this French uh, legacy, French uh, 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 neighborhood quarter. Uh, so there has been a very uh, a dynamic uh, community of French people, uh, obviously French and Chinese people uh, in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, but um, uh, I think, I really think that uh, uh, to start might be with the French, the archives of the French consulate of Shanghai that uh, might be in, um, in Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S. Um, because that's where, uh, that's uh, an annex of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And that's where many archives uh, of the consulate are. Uh, for example, there are also the archives of the consulates of San Francisco after 1906, of course, uh, and Los Angeles. So these are, these are places where you can find the, uh, the documents of the consulate by opposition to the letters that have been written by the consuls that are in the ministry, uh, in the archives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and that is uh, in Piafit, in, uh, in, uh, um, in the north of uh, the Parisian suburb. Well, Dr. Fouquier, thank you so much for fielding so many questions today and for a lovely presentation. And we're now going to hand things back over to Gail to close out our program. You did receive many, many thanks in the oh. Q&A. You can see there are now reactions in webinars so people are able to send little uh, happy faces or hearts. Thank or you so much. Thank clapping. you. Good luck to your research. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, Gail, why don't you come back on? Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Anique Foucrier, for a most comprehensive overview of the history of French migration to California and resources available for researching our French immigrants. Personally, I especially appreciated the examples from the French archives. Dr. Foucrier has kindly permitted us to post the handout for her presentation on our society website and also on the library website. When you visit the Genealogy Society website, you will also find the membership application form there. If you are not already a member of the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County, we cordially invite you to join our society. Thank you for being with us for today's program. Please join us again on the first Tuesday of next month, May 3, 2022, at 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time for Mr. Joao Ventura's presentation on the subject of Azorian and Portuguese research. And then Sarah's going to explain how to register for the program. You go to the library events calendar. All you need to do is enter your first and last name, email address, and then click the optional small yes box at the bottom, which allows the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County to send you more information about a variety of events you may be interested in attending. Once you click on the blue register button at the bottom, you will receive Zoom information for the next program. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon.